Good morning, church family. I'm so glad y'all braved the cold to get out here and worship. So let's stand and, and worship our King who is lying. Welcome, good to see you here this morning, and uh, yes, it is cold, I know, I, I had to cover plants last night, which is so weird in Florida, like, cover my tomato plants, but anyway, I digress, glad you're here, glad you're here this morning, and um, thanks for taking time out to be a part of our services this morning, and so, so glad, if you're a guest 
for taking time to visit with us. I know we've had several guests over the last several weeks, and uh, as we start off the new year, perhaps that's one of those resolutions, like, hey, I want to get connected to church. I want to get connected to the local community of faith. And if that's your, that's your call this morning, we're glad you're here. I'm, I'm the campus pastor. My name is Tim, and I would love to meet you after the service. And so uh, if you would make your way out here to the Connection Hub area in the Fellowship Hall area, right to my right, your left, uh, stop by, say hello. We'd love to give you a free gift just saying thank you for taking time to be a part of our services today. Uh, but, man, just glad you are here. Well, there's been a lot going on in the last several weeks as we get into the new year. And um, yesterday, if you've not been to Membership Intensive yet, we did have one of ours yesterday for the first of the year. And there's uh, about 50 of us from our four campuses. Yeah. And here's our Crystal Beach crew. Let's give it up. It's a good-looking crew, right? I mean, a good-looking bunch. Good-looking bunch. We had a lot of good uh, time yesterday just hearing more about what God's doing here at Calvary. And if you like to be a member, that's, that's the way we do that. You can always volunteer, always get engaged and serve here. But membership maybe is that next step. You may say, I want to be a part of the local community, make this my church home. Uh, mark your calendars for March. We'll be doing it again about March here uh, this next uh, couple months. So love to see you there at that time. Also, as you walked in, perhaps on the way in, either on the Fellowship Hall side or the back doors, you may have seen the 21 Days of Growth devotional guides. I would encourage you, if you've not picked one of these up, uh, stop by, grab one of these. We're all going through this together, uh, the book of Philippians, through each day in devotional and prayer and study of God's Word. And so let me encourage you, if you don't have a devotional thing that you've started, grab one of these. If you have one, use this as a way to walk with all of us as a church. All four of our campuses are going through this 21 Days of Growth Guide. So grab one of those, take it on the way out. It's free of charge. Just grab one. If you have some folks you'd like to give one to, grab a couple extras. That's fine. We'd love for those to, to get utilized. They're not dated. You say, well, Tim, it's like the 21st of January. It's almost over. No, no. You can start today. There's no dates on the book. Just start when you can start and uh, take the next three weeks to really dig deeply in your walk with Jesus. So I want to encourage you to grab one of these. Also, another way you can connect this year is through our groups. We just launched this past week our winter, spring semester, if you call it. Uh, out at the Connection Hub, you'll see green sheets like this. There's groups on Sundays, on Wednesdays, in homes, on campus. There's absolutely something for everyone. So let me encourage you to find a place to connect. One of the ways you can grow in your faith is to be walking alongside others doing the same thing. Uh, you can't do this in a vacuum. You can't do this by yourself. I mean, you can try. Coming to church even can be a little bit anonymous. But when you get into a small group of 10 or 12 or 15 people, and they're walking with you and loving you and praying for you, and you're doing the same for them, there's just nothing like that. And uh, we model the church when we do that, quite frankly. So I'm going to encourage you to grab a sheet, find a group, get connected. You can register today as well if you'd like to do that out there at the Connection Hub. Also, you'll see out here in the lobby, it's a serve team Sunday for us. One of the things that we do every single month is to help people get connected to serve. And uh, let me just kind of do a kind of a PSA moment here. Over the last several months, uh, if you're new with us, you've never really been here that long, you may not know the history of this church, but we launched back in September 11 of 2022. We became a Calvary campus on that date. This community, this church that existed came in a relationship with Calvary and said, hey, what would it look like if we planted a Calvary campus in this community? When we walked in and started that conversation, there were zero children here. Zero. In fact, I remember going through the rooms that were designated as kids' spaces, and it was just, it was just storage, essentially. I'm not speaking ill of what it was. I'm just telling you, this is what we knew God was trying to do in this community, to come alongside and, and, and plant a gospel witness for families in this community. And since that time, we have averaged somewhere between 100 and 120 children in our kids' area. And I don't share that as, a, like, look at us, how great we are. That has, that is absolutely, if you hear me saying that, you don't know my heart. What I'm saying to you is this, that God has a plan and purpose for everyone to know him. And that starts at birth to 90 or 100, wherever you find yourself on that continuum this morning. And God has planted us in this place to minister to families. And he's bringing families. And kids are coming to faith. And they're learning about Jesus. And we're partnering with you, parents, to help them grow and love 
But that takes work. And as I think about where this church was September 11 in just kids' attendance, which was zero, our adult attendance at that time was less than 50 when we started. And we're averaging anywhere between 3 and 350 in our Sunday morning worship attendance. Again, not patting ourselves on the back. This is what God's doing, church. He's building his church. And he promises he will. And he promises that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He's going to build his church. But you know what? He invites us to be a part of that mission. We're not just here to watch the game from the spectators' stands. We're not here to just go, well, good for you guys. You keep going. I'll pray for you all. love you all. Throw a few dollars on the plate. Just keep on going. No, he's invited us to be a part of the work. I remember back in 2016, this church has a long history in Clearwater. If you know anything about Calvary Church, a man who decided God called him to Clearwater to plant a church back in 1866. In 2016, we asked a question. Pastor Willie was the pastor, he's the pastor of our campuses. And he asked a question of the church. He said, what are we going to do on our 150th year anniversary? What are we going to do today that will matter 150 years from now? And that was the inception of our missional strategy, X150, to see God do some things in the life of our church, in the life of our own families and our, and our own hearts so that people could look back and go, you know that church that did that 100 years ago, if it wasn't for that, because we get to stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. And this morning I would ask you a question, the same very question that we were asked in 2016. What are you doing today that will matter 150 years from now? So I'm not going to be around 150 years. It doesn't matter. Your, Your legacy may outlive you. That's kind of the way it works. But for the kingdom's sake, what are we doing that's going to make a difference? So one of the ways we can make a difference is in the lives of children. That is the generation. They're not the next generation of the church. They are the church. They're a part of this church. They are the church. And all of us have a responsibility to help them grow and become more like Jesus. So I'm going to ask Nancy Bentley to come. She leads our children's ministry areas for all of our campuses. Would you give it up for Nancy this morning? <laughs> Nancy, share with us what God's doing and what we can do to help serve. Well, when we, when we ponder what can we do today that will have an impact 150 years from now, I just want to share with you, there have been studies done that show when a child has a relationship with just one person outside of their parents that has the same faith and values, that child has a tremendously better course moving forward to stay connected to a church, to stay connected to the Lord when they complete high school and go off on their own. One adult makes a huge difference. Maybe some of you right now could think of that one adult when you were a child who made a difference in your life and brought you closer to the Lord. And I think when we were children, the world out there was a little different than it is now. Now I think about our kids and it's like it's a desert when they leave here. They're in the wilderness. But I think when they come here to church, when they come to worship, when they come to children's ministry, it's an oasis for them. They get refreshed, they get restored, they get strengthened. Sometimes it's a volunteer back there in children's ministry that's playing Mario Kart with them or foosball with them and just builds that authentic relationship. Ask them how their week was and they really care how it was. Ask how they can pray for them and then does pray for them. Or it's a teacher that opens up God's word and shares the truth about who God is and the relationship they can have with him that can make that difference. These children back here, they are learning. They know what it means that God is sovereign, that he's omnipotent, that he is faithful. They see it in the Bible, and they can see it in their own lives. God's working in the hearts of these kids. I want to share with you something really exciting. Over the past year at Calvary, we've had over 20 children make salvation decisions outside of VBS and 70 baptisms of children. Amen. They all have a story. So I just want you to ponder and pray this morning. You could be a part of one of those children's stories of faith as they grow older. They could sit in a church service 15 years from now, and somebody might say, who is it that had the impact on you when you were younger? It could be you. Just something as simple as being an assistant in children's ministry and playing games with the kids and having those conversations. One of those salvation discussions happened over a coloring page. 
it happens all the time. Or if you have the heart for teaching, we'd be happy to equip you to open the Bible and share God's truth with these kids so you could be a part of their spiritual journey and have an impact on them from week to week and for eternity. So I would just invite you to just ponder and pray about that this morning. Listen, church, we have an opportunity. We have, a, I think, a, a monumental opportunity to come alongside Nancy and our children's ministry teams, our preschool ministry teams, our student ministry teams and say, how can I help? Somebody came to me after first service and said, just tell me where I need to go. Like, just tell me where the biggest need in that area is, I'll, I'll go. He said, well, I got raised my own kids, I just wanted to pray. I, I don't know the church, I'm, that was the church of the New Testament. I don't think they came to church and went, oh, I worked really hard all week with my own kids, I'm just gonna take a break. That's not how that worked in the New Testament, I don't believe. Um, sometimes, sometimes you are the very voice, as Nancy just said, they need to hear. They need to see adults who love them and are praying for them and asking the question the next week. Like, I, we prayed for that thing at school. How did that go? Can you, do you know the impact that has on a child's life when they go, you remembered my name, number one. But number two, you remembered the thing that I told you in a prayer request? And parents, you need that. Your, your kids need that and you need that. And by the way, this is not a babysitting service. We are investing in the spiritual matters of the heart, and these kids, their lives are changed. How many in the room, let me just ask this question. How many in the room came to faith before the age of 18 in this room? How many of you? Look around. A lot of us. And we can all come point back to a Sunday school teacher, a leader, a parent, a grandparent who came alongside and said, I'm going to love you to Jesus. So would you prayerfully consider that today as we look at the serve team and all the things that are happening in our church and finding places to connect. It takes all hands on deck to make this ship run. In this area where God is really blessing, man, get there. Like help me, help us get you there, okay? Can I pray for Nancy? And would you pray with me as we think about what God may be saying in our life and our hearts about this ministry? God, thank you for what you're doing in the midst of this ministry. God, to see 20 kids come to faith, 70 children, through the waters of baptism who have professed you as belief in Lord and Savior. God, I thank you for that. For the majority of us in this room this morning, that was our story. That is our story. We came to faith as a child because someone prayed with us, walked with us, invested in us, loved us enough to share the truth of your word. So God, would you, as, as your church, help us to see where we should connect not out of obligation, not just to fill a hole and check a box, but God, that we would genuinely see this as an opportunity. One hour a week, two hours a week, we spend more time binge watching Netflix than doing that, God. I pray that we'll, you'll soften our hearts to find a place to connect and serve this generation, the generation that is your church and the generation that's going to be the church in the future. So God, you move in us. Thank you for Nancy and the team all those who lead at all of our campuses, all who invest, all of our teachers and leaders currently, would you give them all they need today to love our children well? And God, would you work in us today to find that place where we too can connect in love, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Would you stand? Let's sing together, church, as we continue our time of worship.
Church, as we enter this next moment of worshiping and song, I just wanted to read some scripture. And this is coming from Ephesians 2. We're going to read verses 4 through 9. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him who is seated with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. Church, you are loved so much that God sent his son down to sacrifice and give us a gift. There's nothing that you could do or I could do to earn this. We didn't work for it. And because we don't work for this, that means we can't lose it. Salvation is a gift that you cannot lose and that supersedes time so that we may live with Christ eternally. And so we're singing how deep the Father's love for us. And so as we enter this song and this time of worship, just reflect on how deep God's love truly is in your life. No matter what you have done, you are doing, or you will do, God's love conquers all. So let's sing this together. She's treasure. 
Turn the breath you gave us with praise to you, God. You silence fear and shame, God. You defeat death and grave so that we might live with you eternally. God, with this gift that you've given us that we cannot earn and we cannot lose, God, you are victorious. God, and you are good in your ways. It's in your heavenly name we pray. You can be seated, church. Worthy are you, God. Worthy is your name. Worthy to be praised. What he says? We what? Worship you. You believe that this morning? That's why we're here, right? To worship him. And I hope you came prepared to hear what God has to say in his word. Listen, we can stop church right there, right? Like that was enough. But I believe God's got a word for his church this morning. And I just want to say this. As I prepared this week, um, this, this passage we're going to be in and we've been in over the last several weeks, and we'll be this as we wrap up January, is really just looking at three verses in Philippians chapter 1. And there's so much to unpack in these verses. It's, it's crazy as I just kind of delve into this this week. But I was impressed as I prepared that this message is not just for Everyone in the room. Now, if you know Christ this morning, if you are part of Christ's church today, you've placed your faith in Jesus as Lord, then this message is for you. Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, the believers there in Philippi. He's not talking to the general population of Philippi. He's talking to the church. As you were here last week, and I would encourage you, if you weren't here last week, to go back and listen as we talked about what is it going to look like if we're going to be the church God wants us to be. More importantly, what's it going to look like for us to be the people of God he wants us to be? And so as I prepared, I looked at this message and I thought, you know, there are going to be two audiences in the room perhaps. And if you're new to this thing, this whole idea of who God is and Jesus and never really made that decision to follow him, can I just say, I'm glad you're here. Because I think the message that you're going to hear this morning is not about, it's just not about the church and what we're supposed to do. It's more about who Jesus is and what he desires for us and being his church. That God loves you, that he sent Jesus to die for you, that there's, there's something more for you in this life. Not just for some eternal destiny, but right here and right now. But for the church, can I just ask you, believers in Christ, to lean in this morning. Because this message, I think, will rock us to the core if we're ready to hear what God has to say. It rocked me as I prepared. And I'll be honest, as your pastor, I can tell you, when you prepare messages like this, uh, it's a bit daunting because I know how it might land. I know how this goes. I know how the word of God has convicted my own heart. And I'm not saying because I said it, it convicts you. The word of God has enough power to do that. I'm just the messenger. But I can tell you, as I prepared in my own life and heart to teach to you today, I was rocked to the core about things I'm not doing real great here. And so I'm hopeful that by my learning and your learning that we will become and be the things that God wants us to be. And more importantly, that this year will be a different year in the life of our own walk with Christ and our own journey as a church. So with that being said, turn to Philippians chapter 1. As you're opening there... There was a man by the name of Tertullian who lived a long, long time ago. He, he, was an, he was an apologist who was caught in the middle of what was antagonistic to the church, to Christianity. He was teaching, he was preaching, he was, he was leading, and yet he was being uh, offensive, offended and offensive to those around him in the pagan culture. And he, he reflects on what was going on at that time, and he says it wasn't the theology of the church or even the philosophy of the church that drew people to Christ. It was really the inexplicable love that they had for one another. That was the story that Tertullian was writing about. And he said these words. He says, it was mainly the deeds of love so noble that led many to put a brand upon us. Now, I just want to stop there. 
Would we be known as the church that the world would go, their brand is that they love Jesus and love us? Would that be said of us? I don't know. Would that be said of you? As they see you in the workplace and see you at school and in your neighborhood or your family. That, that man, that woman, the brand on them is that they love Jesus and they love us. So tell you what it continues, it says, see how they love one another. How they are ready to even die for one another. Now he's talking again to the church. He's saying, essentially, if you refer back to Acts chapter 2, that's what the church looked like. The church would get together. They would meet in homes. They would come under the apostles' teaching. They would break bread together. They would pray together. They would give to those who were in need, it says. They would sell all their goods. They would would look around them and go, who needs what? And they would look at their stuff and they'd go, I'll sell that and I'll sell that so that that person doesn't go without. And they had everything in common, it says in Acts chapter 2. And what happened in that church? What happened in that community? It says that people... Thousands were added to the kingdom because of the way that church functioned. This message in Philippians is to the church. And Paul is saying, by this all people will know that you are my disciples. As Jesus said in John chapter 13, if you have love for one another. He's talking to the church. He's not saying, do I just love people outside? No, I'm, I'm talking about are we doing a good job internally? Don't try to export what we're not doing well here. Let's make sure we're doing it right here because that's how the world will know that we're his disciples. And so Paul is saying in Philippians chapter 1, you can just remain seated. But in verses 9 and 10, it says this. If you were here last week, we talked a little bit about this. He says, my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. I'm going to stop there. With knowledge and all discernment. I don't know if you've ever read this passage before. You may be going, what is that? What does that mean? What is that? What is Paul trying to say? Well, first of all, let me just say this. Paul is praying for the church. He understands that if something miraculous is going to happen in the life of this church or any church, God has to show up. It's going to happen because we prayed, that we went after the Father and said, God, do something in our midst that we cannot do, that, that you would be glorified, that the world would know that we are your disciples. Truth be told, nothing in your life this year will happen outside of prayer and God's power in your life. You believe that this year today? That this is the year maybe that God would show you in a way that you never ever experienced before? That he has something bigger than and you fill in that blank? Listen, we can make resolutions all day long, but you know what? We can miss what God wants to truly do. You see, all the things that we hear about in our culture, they pale in comparison to knowing and living under the authority of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's what we're going after, church. So Paul prays that your love may abound more and more. They were already loving really well. They were already doing a good job. This was not news to them. But he said, don't get comfortable. The word abound there in the Hebrew is the word parasio, which means to overflow like a wave upon wave, to cascade, if you can imagine this picture, to cascade like a waterfall, to abound, to, to, to go over the brim, if you will. In our common language, we would say, I pray that your love will grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and so on. He uses the word abound there, but here's the deal. He was not scolding them. He wasn't saying, you aren't doing a good job of loving the church and others as well. I'm just saying, don't get comfortable. Grow better. Get better. Become more abounding in your love for one another. He prays this. In fact, one pastor said, love is never a static achievement for the Christian. It's not like you arrive there and... Boom, I've arrived, I've static achievement. No, it's always growing. It's dynamic. It's expanding. It's improving. Ever abounding and growing for one another. So let me ask you this question. This is just for you and the Lord to answer. If you profess Christ as your Lord and Savior today, is your love for God and for others abounding? Is it growing? Or is it static? Are you stuck? Are you just comfortable? So, well, Tim, I hope so, I pray so, but how would I know? How do I really know? Well, there's some things that are really easy and evident, right? They're tangible. Are you loving Jesus more by the way you act, your attitudes? Are you more generous? Are you more giving in your time and your talents and your resources? Are those things tangibly happening? Well, I hope so. I hope the answer is yes. 
And if they aren't, that's a good litmus test to say, am I really loving God more and loving others more? It comes out in the way you act and serve and live. People will start to say, like, what's going on in your life? Well, I love Jesus more this year. Like, it should be showing up. But Paul is saying here that your love abounds and grows with two ingredients. And I don't want you to miss this. These ingredients are integral in how we love and grow in our love. He uses the words knowledge and discernment. So we're going to look at just those two things today. The first thing there is knowledge. I put in our notes here this morning is scriptural knowledge. Not just informational knowledge. Not reading more books or textbooks about love and God, but really getting in God's word and becoming more guided and understanding of what God's word says about how to love. Scriptural knowledge. This is not the first time he states this. He's not saying that knowledge is more important or love is more important. He says they actually work in tandem. But he said to the church in Corinth, "If if you have a whole lot of knowledge, but you got no love, it's useless. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, he says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And the caution here is when we start to prioritize knowledge, information, what we can kind of amass on our own, at times, if we're not careful, we can actually quench love. We can get too big for our britches, if you will. But Paul says to the Philippians, your love must be guided and informed by scriptural knowledge. So how do I abound? What's he saying here? Well, the word knowledge here in the Greek is used some 20 times in the New Testament. It refers to intensive or deep spiritual knowledge. J.B. Lightfoot said it is the same word used especially of the knowledge of God and of Christ. The knowledge of God and Christ, that being the perfection of knowledge. The more we know about God and Christ, the more it guides the way we live our life. That's the target. And as we gain more knowledge about who he is and being in his word, I don't go to the New York Best Time Sellers list. I don't go to a college textbook. I go to the book. That's how I learn. That's how I grow. That's how I become more mature and knowledgeable. All you need to know about God and Christ and his character is found in the pages of these 66 books. If you're looking elsewhere, stop. Start here. This is his love letter to the church. It's his love letter to all of you in the room this morning. Unfortunately, if we're not careful, we turn to the culture. We allow ourselves to be influenced by what the knowledge gathered from the culture says. That if we just kind of meld there and don't get disconnected from this, or we get disconnected from the scripture, we meld into the culture, we get influenced by that and not by the character of who Jesus is. And we wonder why the church, big C, is floundering. We wonder why we see in our own lives we're trying to live in both tensions, live in the cultural tension and the Christian tension, and we can't seem to find the middle. It's not, there's no middle. It's the Christian tension that we should be living in. We're trying to live in the middle. And you can't straddle the fence. You know how that works. Paul's prayer to the believers is to grow, to conduct yourselves, become more like Jesus so that we would love one another well and the world outside would see the difference. But on this issue of knowledge or scriptural knowledge, let me just expose two lies that the church must not buy into. Number one is this, that Biblical knowledge or doctrine or sound doctrine, you put in the blank there, cannot coexist with love. Like that's a, that's a lie. And let me explain what I mean. Some would say in the church, and again, let me remind you, this is the audience he's talking to, the audience I'm talking to this morning. Some would say, well, the doctrine is too divisive. It causes too much argument. So we just need to love each other and and just let bygones be bygones. Let everybody just kind of go their own way and do their own thing and just love each other. And there's some truth to not getting caught up in things that don't really matter and loving one another. There's some truth to that. But that's a slippery slope. Because what happens, we cave to the notion, we're essentially saying to our fellow brothers and sisters, it doesn't really matter how you live. It's not really a matter what you believe and what you, what you let uh, your behaviors and attitude. Let's just, just keep doing what you're doing. You have your own choices. I'm going to stand idly by and I hope it all works out. That's not love guided by scriptural knowledge. 
It's just not. It's not okay, church, to let us all kind of go in opposite directions and not help each other get back to where we need to be. So we cave to the culture because that's what the world says. Just love everybody where they are and let them all do their own thing. And, and we let that happen in our churches. And some of you in this room this morning have seen where that has debilitated and destroyed the church by your own experience. In fact, in Galatians chapter 6, Paul said, brothers, and I put and sisters there. See the girls in the room? You cannot. If anyone, again, this is the church. If anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of rudeness. No. Gentleness. Loving them back to where they need to be. Helping them get there. Don't be the finger pointer. Grab their arm. Love them there. And by the way, as you're doing that, keep watch on yourself, he says, lest you too be tempted. You could get in the same boat. See, the people in that type of lie believe it's all about the heart and not the head. But the second lie is this, that doctrine, spiritual knowledge, supersedes love. That yeah, I know, Tim, I'm supposed to love my brother and my sister. I get it. Yeah, 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 I get it. But, you know, got to get them right. They're, they're, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the judge, jury, and executioner. I'm going to do all that needs to be done. That's, that's my role in the church. I had a person say to me one time, this is a long time ago, not here, so if you're not looking around, nobody said it here. I remember somebody saying, I feel like my calling is to call out incorrect doctrine in the church. Now, I just want to let you know, they were not the happiest, loveliest people I know. They were good at it, but they weren't doing it the way God intended for it to be done. We're not here to call each other out. That's not the, you could flip the script the other way and go, well, I just love, love, love. No, no. You're also not just here to go, you, 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 and you, and you. That's not the call either. Because what happens, we begin to believe in our own hearts that our harsh attitudes and our sharp judgments are justified. That's not true. You don't get to do that. You can't high-five each other in the corner and say, look how correct we are. Paul writes in the same chapter in Galatians chapter 6, for if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. In the same passage, he says those words. We can major on the minors. We can get all caught up in the minutia. In fact, as we talked about this yesterday in the membership intensive, there are core doctrinal truths we will not equivocate on. Who is Jesus? Who is God? What is the Bible? What is sin? What is heaven? What is hell? What is humanity? Like there's just core doctrines we will not equivocate on. But you know what? I'm not going to get into the minutia of how you dress on a Sunday morning or what did you eat for dinner or, and you pick the thing. But I know as I grew up in a church like that, where it was all about how I acted and talked and walked and the way I had my hair and if I wore shoes or not shoes or ties or no ties or whatever, like that became the thing. And I believe that's what it was supposed to look like because I didn't have any, I had no other model of that. It was all legalism, fundamentalism, hyper-Calvinism, you fill in the blank, but it, it was all head and no heart. And so the world looks at us and says, oh, they're a bunch of hypocrites. They, yeah, da, 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 da. They're right. Because we have a, we personified that we're all about you're right or we're right and you're wrong. That's what we personified as a church. And Jesus said, they'll know by the love you have for one another. That should be the storyline. They should be looking at us and go, man, that church loves well. And can I just tell you, Calvary Crystal Beach Church, this church loves well. It really does. I, can't, I cannot remember a church that loves so well. But can I tell you, as Paul told the church, don't get comfortable. Don't relish the, oh, look how loving we are. There's more to go. There's more to grow. There's more to learn. And it all happens as a part of our sanctification. As we grow in Christ, we will love more. I mean, biblical Christianity is this, love the Lord your God, right, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. We cannot give away what we are not doing ourselves. Is that true of you this morning? I think you get the point. I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but 
knowledge, scriptural knowledge and love must work in tandem. Neither opposes the other or supersedes the other. John MacArthur said it this way, love for God or others that is not based on truth is just diluted emotionalism. But truth devoid of love leads to arrogance. They work in tandem. Scriptural knowledge answers the question, why should we love? In fact, if I asked you the question this morning, I said, hey, church, why should we love? Some of you would say, because Jesus said so. The Bible commands me to, and you would be right. But what motivates us to love? Because if it's only motivated by a command and not by by an overwhelming love of our own hearts, then is there any motivation to keep loving? Like think about a relationship. If I would married my wife and it was at the marriage vows and they said, you will love her and you will love him. And I go, okay. And that was the end of the story. No. Because as I learn to love her more, as I become more like Jesus, I want to be a better husband. I want to love her more like Christ loves me more. I grow in that. It's not, a, it's not do this or else. I do this because I'm motivated by something. Motivated by what God has done for me and in me. Sure, we're commanded to love. But why? I remember asking those questions as a young kid in school, in church, Sunday school. Hey, why does it? And it was like, because God said so. It's like parents, right? Why do I have to? Because I said so. Is that a motivating factor? Like over time, like they're, they're, sooner or later, 18, they're going, you, don't have, you can't tell me so anymore. I'm gone. What motivates them to stay on the narrow? What, is, what helps them motivate and stay on the path of righteousness? Like nothing if you're just like do, 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 and to leave the house. So the motivations for me and you, I hope, this morning, I've got two reasons why we love. I don't know, there's, there's way more than this. But the first one is this. I am loved. You are loved by God in Christ. That's a motivation. To love is because you and I have been loved. We are loved. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul said, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us. We love because he loves us. We are loved by God in Christ. I want to obey. I want to love because I've experienced that love. 1 John 4, 19 says, We love because he first loved us. And by the way, when I am truly overwhelmed by his love for me, the natural byproduct is loving one another. Start there, not here. Start with loving him more. You'll start loving each other better. I promise. That's how this works. And that knowledge of all that God has done through Christ, all of that love letter I talked about can be found here. The more you understand how much he loves you, that you grapple with, it's not just a one and done at salvation, but he is loving you now and loving you through this life and doing things in places you don't know is going on and he's got your best interest at heart. When that, that fact grapples you and you're like, oh, I, can't, I, can't, I can't break away from that. He loves me so much. You want to love him more. But here's what happens if we're not careful. We stop loving him more. We start relying on our emotional love and what's in it for me and... We start becoming inward instead of outward, and we start becoming selfish and prideful, and all of a sudden our our motivations to love are illegitimate motivations to love. We see love as a moral obligation. We see, well, the pastor says I got to love you, so okay. But it's not sincere, right? We know this. Or we love to try to repay something that we cannot pay for, a debt we cannot take care of. So we start loving different. We try to love better, maybe, to say, well, if I love better, I'll receive something in return. Or sometimes love just is empty flattery, if we're we're really honest. We throw love around like candy at Halloween. Love you, man. Love you, bro. Yeah, I love you too. But do we really sincerely mean it? Because if we truly meant it, if we look back at the Acts chapter 2 church, man, the way we did church, church would be different. The way we did our lives would be different. All of a sudden, it's not about me anymore. It's not about what I get out of the deal. It's not what I attain, but what God has done in me, and I just want to give that away. We only love well and to the glory of God when our love for one another is driven, energized, governed by the knowledge of the kind of love that God has for us in Christ. 
that's the, that's the way love happens. And by the way, that message of God loving you is the gospel. To be reminded of all that Christ did through Jesus, or God did through Jesus for you and for me. That is the message of the gospel. And by the way, you need to tell yourself the gospel every day. You got to remind yourself every day how much God loves you. That's why we love. Another reason why we love is I am forgiven by Christ. You're forgiven by Christ. Church, listen, again, I'm speaking to the believers in the room. You have been forgiven by God in Christ. Ephesians chapter 4 says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Another way to say this in terms of loving and forgiveness, you cannot give away what you do not have not received. If you've not received God's love, if you've not received his forgiveness, you can't give it away the way Paul is writing here. But if you have, you know what that feels like. You know what that means. And all of us in the room have a story. You don't have to have a a horrific story to know how much you've been saved from. Some of you in the room this morning have those kinds of stories like, man, God saved me from, and you fill in the blank. And some of you are like, well, I grew up in a Christian home, and I didn't come. Listen, God saved you from your sin, and you are destined for hell without it. You understand this, church. Everyone in the room. Loved by God, forgiven by God, given his mercy, given his grace. When was the last time you went, thank you? And listen, when you say thank you and you understand how that, what that means in your life, it changes how you treat other people. And you're, please do not be deceived. If you're treating people unforgiving and unloving, you're a hypocrite. Because that's not what Paul is saying here. You can't say on one side of the mouth, I love Jesus and honor and glorify him and I'm do all I can do to serve him and, do, and then hate your brother or hate your sister in Christ. Yeah, but you don't know what they did to me, Tim. It doesn't matter. What they said, those, no, it doesn't matter. The love you have received, church, give it away. If you've not received that love this morning, can I just tell you that love, that extension of that gift is for you today. But love him well church. In Luke chapter 7, we read a story, you know this if you've been in church at all, you know the story of the woman who was found in sin, a woman who by all accounts in the town, everybody knew, they knew who this woman was, the things she had done. I'm not going to get into the minutia of what happened in her, in her life, but I can tell you the beauty of this story is what we all need to hold on to today. That she knowing who she was. She knew, she knew her sin. She knew where she was. The Pharisees were ridiculing her. They were ridiculing Jesus for even hanging out with people like her. The disciples were dismissive. Jesus is, is lounging. He's having a meal. And this woman walks in with this thing called an alabaster jar of perfume. Remember this story? We don't know how she attained it. It may have been a gift or an heirloom or her retirement savings, something she invested in. But in our current currency, it would be like $50,000. Maybe all she had. But in her sin, needing a, a loving Savior and forgiveness, she knew all she could do is lay herself at the feet of Jesus and receive what he was already extending to her. And so she lays down at his feet. She anoints this takes this perfume, anoints Jesus' head. She cries over his feet. It's obvious that she's broken over her sin. She takes her hair, it says, and she wiped his feet clean. If you know anything about the culture, the dirtiest part of the body in that culture were the feet. But she didn't care. She knew what she needed. She needed his love and his forgiveness. And before he even extended forgiveness to all those who were watching, all those who were kind of maybe speculating what he would do, In verse 47 of Luke chapter 7, he says this. He's talking to all the people watching. He says, therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are now forgiven. For she, listen to what he says, loved much. Now just stop there for a moment. Have you been loved much this morning? Have you, in any account, as you reflect on your life, go, man, I am so loved God has done something for me that I did not deserve. He's given me all and more than I could ever imagine. He has loved me much because here's what he says. But he who is forgiven little, the one who thinks they're all that, the one who says, well, I'm not as bad as her or my sins aren't as black as hers or his. 
But he who is forgiven little loves little. There's something to be said of our love when we realize how much we've been forgiven. And we find out what that storyline is right here. It tells us how much we've been forgiven. And I suspect this lady who came to a saving knowledge of God and that Jesus in that day, I imagine the next time she had the chance to extend forgiveness, I, I pray, she acted entirely different than she did before. Like she, I, I get it. I've, exce- I've received it. I know what it means. I know what it feels like. I have been, I have been saved. And I am not going to withhold love and I'm not going to withhold forgiveness. I'm not going to do it because God did so much for me. That's what scriptural knowledge tells us. This is why we love church. But not only do we see scriptural knowledge as being an ingredient of abounding love, but number two, we see spirit-led discernment. He uses the word discernment here in the Greek. It's only found in this letter to the Philippians. It's the only time it's found in the New Testament in this book. But it appears 22 times in the book of Proverbs, which gives us a glimpse a little bit of what Paul may have been directing here. But practically speaking, he's saying by the power of the Holy Spirit, that knowledge, that scriptural understanding that you and I have is now being guided by the Spirit and how you apply it to those situations in your life. As you learn more about his love and his forgiveness, you understand what his character is about. When you start putting that stuff into practice, now you're loving because you've been loved, you've been forgiven. The Spirit of God will now show you how to love. That's what this means, discerning how to. You've all heard the old proverb, love is blind. I've often wondered why people say that. I thought maybe because they didn't like their spouse or something. I'm not even sure what that meant. But I looked it up, and it simply says, loving someone so much that you don't see their faults. Now, on its face, that sounds like a really great Hallmark card for Valentine's Day. So if you all get a love is blind card, send it back. (laughs) Because real love, God's love, the love in us as a follower of Jesus is insightful. It's perceptive. It's it's not afraid to speak truth into a situation or into a relationship. It sheds light on what's right and what's wrong. It helps people to get back on the right path. And conversely, gullible or blind or naive or even impulsive love, that can be dangerous and even deadly. Imagine that your spouse you've been married to for the last how many years never spoke truth to you. I just love them. They walk on, I mean, they're like, it's rainbows and sunshines. Like, it's all the time. They're just so great. I remember I'd sit down with young couples who were getting married for the first time, and I asked them a question, have you ever had an argument? And they're like, oh, no, we could never argue. I said, go get an argument and then come back and see me. <laughs> you got to argue, right? You got to go through this process. This is how love grows. You know this, right? But you can imagine that no marriage would ever on its face survive with us just kind of overlooking people's faults. Like, well, they'll get there one day. No more than it is when you're always pointing out their faults. Can you imagine that being love at all? That's the antithesis of love. Like, like if you were parenting your children that way, you'd, no, none of us are like, we'd never do that with our kids. Yet we do it with each other. And more importantly, we do it with each other in the church. That's disastrous to the family of God and to the family you live in. A person who possesses love but lacks discernment may reveal a great deal of eagerness and enthusiasm. He may donate to all kinds of causes and motives may be worthy and intentions honorable, yet he may be doing more than harm than any good. Discernment in this text is a biblically discriminating love exercised by a mind and a heart under the control of the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again, because you all weren't paying attention. Discernment in this text is a biblically discriminating love. That means it is guided by this. When you start guiding your love by how you feel or what that person did or didn't do for you, you are not being guided by this. Are you paying attention? And you have this 
exercised by the mind, by the heart, under the control of the Holy Spirit. You don't get to make decisions in your own strength. You are not in charge if you know Jesus today. And yet we have taken the wheel back from the Lord saying, well, I got a better plan. God just wants me to be happy. God wants me, and you fill in the blank. That is not true. He is less concerned about your comfort and your happiness. He's more concerned with your character. So as you are judiciously loving people, wisely loving people, it's because it's guided by his word and by his spirit. Both in tandem. Not one or the other at the same time. That's the kind of love Paul is talking about. So what does that look like practically? Well, for the believer in the room, as you think about how that plays out in the church, we love when we confront sin. We love when we confront sin. If you think loving someone means you keep silent as you watch a fellow brother or a fellow sister going off the rails, You see them going the wrong direction. You say, well, yeah, but everybody's entitled to their own thing. They make their own choices. You don't get to do that if you are a member of the family. You don't. You would never do that with a family member biologically. Why would you do that spiritually? To confront them and help them. Maybe they don't even see it. Here's what I've learned. I don't see things that are in my life, but everybody else does. We all have blind spots. We all have this, well, I'm fine, you're fine. No. If no one tells me, hey, Tim, you said something, did something, did you mean that, did you not mean that? Had someone grabbed me this morning on the way in today, said, I just need to talk to you about something. Did you mean this when you said this? We had five minutes. I said, no. What I meant was that we talked about it, we hugged, we walked on, we're good. If she doesn't do that, what happens if that doesn't happen? Jealousy, bitterness. Stuff starts like, did he say that again? Did he mean that to me? Was he calling me? No, no. you got to call it out. Expose the darkness to the light of the gospel. Like, use the word to expose what is dark. Because if you don't, it will stay dark. That's love. Imagine standing idly by watching a friend drive off towards the edge of a cliff, knowing you knowing that the road was out, but not telling them. Would that be loving? Of course not. Discernment takes that knowledge that the road is out, that the cliff is coming, and says, you know what, I need to say something. And listen, if they don't believe you, and the enemy lies to them and says, well, the cliff doesn't exist, and the road is fine, and they run off the side of the cliff, did you say what you needed to say? Did you do what you needed to do to be responsible for their spiritual, in this case, temporal existence? We have to shine God's truth to the lies that the enemy keeps telling us. And listen, if we fail to, if we ignore it, if we minimize it, we are by default endorsing it. If you knew and you said nothing, you follow? So that's what that means. I love when I confront sin. Discerning love does not stand idly by. You take responsibility. Now, let me just be really clear here. Because I know some of you, the brain is ticking and you're thinking, man, I'm going to go back and tell my husband that Tim said. (laughs) I know what you're thinking. You're human just like I am. I am not, I am not saying your life's goal is to wield the gavel and be the judge, jury, and executioner for people in your life in the church. That's not what I'm saying. Because you might want to look at the log in your own eye. This process of learning what it means to have the knowledge is also looking in the mirror. And seeing where God may be exposing those places in your own life. So before you run out of here and say, Tim gave me the authority to say and do these kind of things. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is this. Our goal in confronting sin is to restore, to help, to bring people back to where they need to be. And if you're concerned with how they might respond and you're like, well, I won't say anything because if they respond badly, they won't like me anymore. Or they may, they, it may get worse for them or worse for me or whatever. If you, if you believe that, the hard truth is you will be guilty of loving yourself more than you love them. 
confront sin. But you don't do it with guilt and shame and judgment. You don't dredge up the past. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We keep no record of wrongs when we love people the way we should love them. Because you got your own record. But we love them because God took our record and he, cut, he cleaned it by the blood of Jesus. And you too can extend that kind of love. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15, speak the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head. That means we're all to be continuing to grow to become more like Jesus. And in doing so, we realize that we do it in love. Guided by his word, governed by his spirit. And when we abound more and more in that kind of love, we will see greater things in our marriages, in our homes, in our workplaces, yes, in the culture, in our church. But what about those who have yet to place their faith in Jesus? What, do you, what about those? Do, am, I, am I called to love them? Absolutely. The answer is yes. The fact of the matter is, that is the story of the gospel. That's the second point. When we love, we share the gospel. When we're loving the way we should be loving, we are telling other people about that same love. So how do we love those who still need to know the truth? I often counsel people this way. You can't expect, as you share truth to those who are outside of the truth, you can't expect them to know what that means. You can't expect people to act a way that they cannot act. Don't get mad at their sin because they're, they're not acting right. Listen, they don't know any different. you got to love them there. you got to build a relationship there. I, I've learned that most people are not antagonistic when you build a relationship with them. The Philippian church, they knew all too well the paganism of the culture. They were in the midst of some of that kind of stuff ongoing. Paul was not saying go love the people outside the church better in this letter here. He's saying you got to do a better job internally. Then as you're doing that better, the other stuff will follow. The people that were watching the church in Philippi were likely going, man, look at that church. They love God. They love us. And God would use that, as Tertullian would say, with not our theology, not our philosophy, but just loving well. All the more reason, church. Here's why it's so important in this culture. We need to be grounded in scriptural knowledge. Don't tell people you need to do this because the Bible tells you. You show them. And if you can't show them, get in here and find it. you got to be grounded in scriptural knowledge. You have to be. You have to be led by the Holy Spirit. And some of those hard times and hard conversations, there are times where it can become argumentative. And by the way, you're never going to argue a person to the kingdom. Your social media feed is not going to bring some more people to Jesus because you got on some tirade about what was done or what was said in the politics or the government or this or that. Can I just say this, church? If you're doing that nonsense, just stop. You're not giving any, like God's not being glorified. He's not being lifted up. It's just more attention on you. Just stop doing that. I get, I chafes me when I see the believers in the church jumping on the next cultural bandwagon. Stop doing that. Share Jesus. Love well. Love them well. Show them what loving Jesus means. Do that. And the rest will follow. But sometimes gospel conversations are hard, aren't they? If you really had one, you know this. Especially if you don't know what to say and being grounded. But Jesus said, there were a couple of instances in the, in the Bible where he said, sometimes if they don't want to listen, if they don't want to hear, it's time to move on. Like if you've done all you can do, it's the Holy Spirit's job to draw them. But if you've done all you can do, shake the dust off. In Matthew chapter 10, he says this to the disciples. He says, Hey, I want you guys to go out. Don't go here, don't go here, don't go here. But I want you to go to the lost sheep of Israel. That's what he says in chapter 10, verse 6. And then he says, you know, find people of peace there, hang there, tell them about the kingdom, all that kind of thing. But if anyone will not receive you, he says in verse 14 and 15, or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet and move on. It's pretty harsh, right? Like, man, Jesus is like dropping the hammer. What he was saying there was this. They're not ready, but there are other people who are. Go find them. Go tell them about Jesus. 
We're to love them. We're to pray for them. We're to, we're to expose them to what the truth of the gospel is. It doesn't change our dynamic. And by the way, this is not an out. Like, well, Tim said, I just dust the, you know, dust the stuff off my sandals and move on. No, no, no. We are called to be the gospel. We're to, be, to share the gospel. But if it's not being received, Jesus says, you know, go ahead. It's okay. Move on. Find others who will be ready. He even talks about it in Matthew chapter 7. It's an even a more harsher tone. But if you think about Matthew chapter 7, he's talking about how you love your enemies. I'm not talking about loving your enemies in Matthew chapter 10, although there may be some antagonism there. But you know who your enemies are, right? The ones that are mocking your faith, the ones who are constantly antagonistic, making rude jokes at the water cooler, talking about that Christian whatever thing you do. Like, those are the enemies. And he says, don't throw your pearls before swine or dogs. Don't do it. Don't do it. Matthew chapter 10, read it. Or 7, read it. Read it. I'm not going to do it tonight, just for time. But some of us in this room... If it weren't for someone who loved us enough to say, Jesus loves you, he has a purpose and plan for your life, we wouldn't be sitting here today. And maybe you weren't antagonistic. Maybe God was softening your heart. And this is what we need to be praying, church, as a church. Not everybody's going to receive the message. Not everybody's going to be happy to hear you share it. But that doesn't get us off the hook. You say, well, Tim, I tried once, it didn't work, I moved on. No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. You go to the next person and to the next person. And so that's intentional, right? It's building a relationship with people in your life intentionally to be the gospel to them. That means you go to the same person who cuts your hair. Do you talk about all the junk in the week in the ball game or do you you talk about like life stuff? It's going to the same clerk at the Publix or it's the Winn-Dixie. You're going to be intentionally sitting in their space at the restaurant, like all the things you do, be intentional. And over time, you may see an opportunity. And by the way, as you're faithful, it will. I was using an example this week. I was so proud of my wife, Georgia, who was at a dry cleaners this week. And she's been ministering to the lady there, talking to her, just sharing, hey, invite you to church. How can I pray for you? Just being very intentional. Same lady every single time. Yesterday, as she went and got the laundry, was it yesterday? Yesterday. She said, I lost my brother before Thanksgiving. He was 50 years old. And out of the blue. Because she always, you know how George is. Like, hey, how you doing? Well, I'm not so good. I lost my brother. Died of a massive heart attack, 50 years old. She's kind of a little older than him. Been smoking a lot of years in her life. Just similar kind of story. She goes, but you know what? I prayed. She said, I woke up one morning. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't breathe. And I prayed, God, if you, if you let me live, I will turn my life around. Now, her step was, she's been, she hasn't been smoking for what, four months? Four weeks, rather. She said, she I'm stop smoking. She said, I'm praying. And George was just kind of conversing, and then people started coming in, and she used a euphemism, and then we moved on. But the bottom line is, this lady is now going, I need Jesus. And she saw George as someone who would share that with her because George has been intentionally saying, I love you, I'm praying for you, how can I pray for you this week, that kind of thing. Listen, that's how it usually happens. It generally happens that way. It will not be a guy with a sandwich board on the side of the road saying turn or burn, fly or fry. That's not how this works. Let's just be real. It will happen because... You're loving them. You're intentional. And when you get a proposition, can I just tell you, Jesus was opposed. It's not going to be easy. I'm not saying this is easy. But when God's working in somebody's heart, it's easy. God's working in this lady's heart. She's going to come to faith. We believe it. Who are those people in your life? Who are you loving to Jesus? Here's what I would say, church, in summary. Love without scriptural knowledge is built on misinformation. Love without spirit-led discernment breeds frustration. But love with both scriptural knowledge and spirit-led discernment is God's revelation. That's how it gets done. That's how this works. So here's what I want to end with. You say, well, how do we, how does this manifest? How does this happen? 
I said this last week, and I don't know, I hope I didn't offend anybody last week, but I said this last week. I said, I don't know how we as believers can say we love Jesus with our heart, soul, mind, and strength and not be fully invested in whatever God tells us to do. I don't know how that works. I don't know how we can come week after week, Sunday after Sunday, whatever you pick the thing. And we say, oh, yeah, I love Jesus. Man, I get in their worship, and I love it. It's such a great Sunday. But yet, we come, we go, nothing changes. I'm going to put my pastor's hat on for just a moment. Because as God loves us and doesn't want to leave us where we are, I love you too much not to call this out. And I do this in love. I really do. But if you are just kind of going through the motions, man, I love Jesus my whole heart, but I can't get along with my husband. Well, I love Jesus, but man, if you're going to ask me to serve, I just that's one more hour a week I just don't want to give to Jesus. I had a conversation this past week with someone who was telling me all the things that he wanted to do. Well, I want to do this, and I want to do that, and I want to do this. I'm like, well, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, time out. Did did you pray about that? Have you asked God to show you what he wants you to do? Because if it's really all about you, can you ever imagine, listen, can you imagine Jesus going with his hands held out, his hands are pierced and his feet are pierced, he's got a crown of thorns on his head, and he says, I did this so you could have whatever you wanted and do whatever you want to do. I committed my entire, I, I left all of heaven, all of its glory, I took on human frame. I lived a sinless life. I died a horrible death for you. And you would say to me, I just want to do this. And you pick whatever that is. It's all about me. Listen, I don't know how that works. I, as I prepared this week, I knew that was, I was wrestling with that. I was wrestling with, there are some in this room have given every bit of what they have and more. So I don't want you to hear me not encouraging you to keep on keeping on. But I can tell you, Christianity is not a spectator sport. You don't get to just come, sit, soak, and sour. I'm reminded of, there's a a sponge illustration. I used to use this with student ministry. And I used to, like, take a sponge, and I put it in a bowl of water. And then I put water all over a table. And I'd say, Any, all you kids, come on up. But I want you to grab that sponge out of that bucket of water. And I want you to go ahead and clean that water up. But you can't wring it out. You can't wring it out. you got to just take the sponge out of that water and start trying to, and it's, it's impossible, right? You can't, you can't wring it. You can't do that unless you wring the sponge out. you got to wring yourself out of all of you and all your stuff and all your things you want to do and not do. And so, so you have to wring yourself out and say, God, fill me with you. And when that happens, you're useful you're available, you're, you're, you're able to do the things he wants you to do. But we come to the table and we go, God, here's my, here's my terms. I'll do this as long as you do that. I'll do this on my terms, on my timeline, on my talents and my treasures. And then you find a hole, God, where you can fill it with you. Can I just tell you, that's not Christian love. That's not how the church works. That's not what happened in Acts chapter 2. And I don't think that's what he's calling us as a church to do today. In fact, if we start doing Acts chapter 2 church here, this whole community would go, those people are crazy over there. What are they doing over there? Not for our glory, church, but for his. And so I'm asking you this morning, we're going to sing a song, Resurrender. You know, some of you have heard this song before. Maybe it's new to you. But the song is really saying, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay myself back at your feet. I, the, I'm, I am not just going to play games anymore. I want to be holy. I want to be useful. I want to do all that you want me to do. I'm not going to just kind of jog it to you or walk to you. I'm going to run to you so I can be all that you want me to be. That's what this song is all about. We're going to sing it. But I'm going to have our team sing it behind us. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your heads. And as they come to sing it, here's what I want you to do. Listen to the words. Just listen. It's a new song to you. The words will be on the screen. But right there in your seat, 
would this be your song today? Would you say, yeah, I am in love real well. And it starts with loving Jesus. It starts with me getting out of the way, putting my agenda to the side, putting my feelings and emotions and all the things that I think are, I'm entitled to, putting all that aside and saying, Jesus, it's all about you. You, in this moment, do in me what you want to do. I resurrender. For some of you in the room, maybe that's your cry today. That 2024 would be a year of resurrender for you. For some of you in the room who have not surrendered to Jesus yet, you've not said yes to his plan and purpose for your life. Can I just tell you, he loves you, he has a plan for you, and it's greater than you can ever think or imagine. It's the greatest decision you will ever make in your life to come into a love relationship with your creator and call him father and friend. Some of us have been in church a long time. We've gotten pretty stagnant, gotten pretty used to doing our thing. Well, Tim, I put a lot of years in. So yeah, I get it. Yeah, but I've been working and serving the church a long, long time. Is it gonna matter in eternity? Is God gonna look at your check sheet and go, wow, look at all the hours you put in for me. You get a better kingdom home than the next person. No, he's looking at your heart this morning and going, are you fully surrendered to me? You got nothing to offer me. Just give me your life. And I'll take it and I'll use it and I'll do things in you you can never imagine. So here's what we're going to sing. Sing it. Those are going to sing behind us. You don't have to sing it. Just sit. Listen to the words. Guys, go ahead and sing. Reflect on these words. Is this the cry of your heart? Is this what God is saying to you and in you and through you this morning?
sing these words. And he's calling, he's calling you to himself this morning. He's calling you to a greater commitment, a, a greater understanding of who he is, to make you holy as he is. And these next words we're going to sing is if you're calling, I'm not walking, I'm running. I'm not just going to jaunt to you, God. I'm not going to just kind of change my priorities a little bit and kind of focus on you a little bit more this year. No, no. I'm going to turn from where I'm running, and I'm going right after you. As God and the the man and the prodigal son, the father who stood at the doorway and saw his his son, he didn't just kind of meander out to his son. He ran to his son. And maybe you need to run to the father this morning. So as you sing these words in your heart, may they be the true cry of your heart. I'm not just going to walk. You tell me to go, God, and I'm running. I'm getting there. And what does that look like? Only God and you know. But sing these words as you mean it. But God, knowing that God is going to hold you to it. Let's sing it together. we we want to see you do things in our life this year that we could not think, hope, or imagine but we know it begins in a walk and relationship with you God forgive us we confess where we have gotten in the way gotten in our own way trying to be in control and do the things that are convenient and comfortable for us and our emotions and our feelings and how it matters to me and how happy I am and all those things. God, forgive me. Forgive us. God, you gave your son. You gave all. That would be enough for us to serve you in all of our life and all of our ways we do our things. But God, we are so, so sinful at times. 
And this re-surrender is not a song on a Sunday morning. This re-surrender is every single day. Denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following you. God, convict our hearts where we have gotten complacent. Shine light on the dark spots of our hearts where even just you and I know it or we know it with you, but maybe no one else knows it. God, shine light on that. Expose that. As your church, may we love one another well, confronting those things, not wielding judgment, God, but to, but to help each other, spur each other on to godliness. And as we do these things, God, as we learn to love you more because of your word and because of the spirit of God that resides in us, as we do those things, God, we will see, we'll see you do things in us. And the world will know that we are your disciples. So God, keep working in us. Thank you that you haven't stopped loving us, that the gospel is as true to our lives today as was the day we said yes to you as our Lord and Savior. For those in the room, God, who do not know you, my prayer today is that they hear how much you love them. They would not leave here. If there's a prompting, a, maybe a poking on their heart, even as I pray right now, God, I pray they would not leave here without telling someone, asking a question, so they too might know you as father and friend. So God, as we leave today, we ask your blessing. God, we want to do what your blessing. So God, let us join you in whatever that is in the days to come, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. As we leave this morning, church, let me just say this. I know we went a little bit late. It's okay. IHOP will still be open. Don't worry about it. But if God's working in your heart right now, if there's something that God is doing, our team stands ready to walk that out with you, to pray with you, to help you take your next steps. One of those steps might be to start in a group. It might be to get into a daily Bible study. It may be to start giving this year generously and maybe over and above what you could think or imagine that God would use your gifts and your talents in serving him. Our serve team leads are out here in the lobby. Stop by and find a place to connect. How this stuff gets lived out is not in word, it's in deed. The Bible says a faith without works is dead. So it leans in as we love and learn to love each other. It happens in our deeds and our actions. So find those places, find those ways. Let us help you come alongside and do that. And God will bless you for it, I promise. So as we leave today, take the step, whatever that is, take it. God will honor it. Amen. Let me pray for you. Jesus, as we leave today for this church body, do what you will do. May we submit to your authority, to your word, to your spirit, to be and do the things, God, you want us to be and to do. God, not in our own strength, but submitting wholly and solely to your will. And in doing so, God, we give you thanks in advance for how you're going to use us to see your kingdom come, not just in heaven, but here on earth. But it starts in our hearts. It starts in this church. God, may we be a beacon of light and hope to those around us who would say, that's what the church looks like. That's what love looks like because they've been so loved and so forgiven. So God, help us to live always reminded of your goodness and your grace, we pray in Jesus' name.